You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 67, The Early Days of the FinCon Financial Conference with Philip Taylor, a.k.a. P.T. Money. Let's go. What's up and welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. Thank you for joining us this week. So I've been to a lot of conferences recently in the past, let's say, year or so. And one thing always stood out to me. While I appreciate different aspects of each of the conferences that I've been to, I've always had this idea in the back of my head that it's just not quite the conference that I want to attend. So I was sitting around one day working on the podcast and I thought, well, what if I create my own conference? And so it got me thinking like, okay, what would I do and what would I include or what would I leave out or how would I change it or make it different than the other conferences that I've been to, which have been good, but not exactly what I'm looking for. And I came to the idea that, sure, well, let's just think this through. So part of the research that I went through was contacting some people that I know who have created, built, organized, successful conferences. And our guest today is Philip Taylor, or as he's better known as PT Money. So PT back in 2004 started a personal finance blog. His father was a CPA and he was a CPA. This is just something that he was interested in and which came naturally for him. So he decided to create a blog called ptmoney.com back in 2004 and was one of the first bloggers actually opening up their personal books and telling you exactly the insides of their personal finance, which at that point in 2004 was not common. And so back then it was much more common to have a pseudonym. Uh, I had my own pseudonym. I'm sure you did too on AOL chat rooms and stuff like that. But to protect the privacy and identity of the person explaining their personal finances, he, Philip went by the name PT Money. So in this episode, I'll be calling him PT, and he tells us all about the idea to create a personal finance blog in 2004 and how that morphed into creating an actual financial conference called FinCon. You know, we live in this digital world, so many digital societies. We're no longer bound to just our geography to help us find people that we vibe with. But instead, we can now use the internet to help find ideologically sound people. No longer do we have to just be secluded in our digital communities because entrepreneurs like PT and hopefully myself create in real life conferences every year to try to bring all of us together so we can network and have that human connection that's oftentimes lost or missed in our digital lives. So I didn't realize that we were going to record. This was just a, uh, a phone call between PT and I so that I could learn some more of the ins and outs of creating a conference and how to make it profitable and successful. But the content was just so good that I had to share it with you, Liberty Nation, in case some of you are thinking about creating a conference. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Remember to like and share us on social media and iTunes, YouTube. Without further ado, let's get right into the show. PT, my man, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Ah, it's just great to be with you, man. So just give us a brief bio of who you are, what you're passionate about, and how you got the idea to start the FinCon conference. Yeah, so... Um, former CPA or still have the license that so came up through traditional sort of accounting ranks. My dad's a CPA as well. Spent 10 years in that profession uh, doing uh, corporate finance as well as public accounting. But I, I always sort of felt like entrepreneurship was something I wanted to do. I tested out maybe having a firm for, for myself, but never really got behind the idea of like one-on-one -on -one client work. So I knew there was something else out out there for me. Along comes the internet, blogging, and uh, I discovered personal finance blogs about 2004. Mm. Started reading wow. them of obsessing about fixing my own financial life and uh, just was inspired to start my own. But thinking, hey, I've got my own spin on this, I've got my own take, and then I'm a CPA, so I can throw in some tax and accounting stuff in there and have some authority to speak on it. So started that in 2007. Three years later, I uh, took that full-time, was a full-time blogger, 
and uh, needed something else to do on my nights and weekends. So I decided to start a conference for the people who were doing what I, uh, what I do, which is create content online and in the personal finance space. And that's either through a blog or a podcast or video uh, that's small publishers. And now even big publishers, big platforms, everyone's online now, everyone's digital. Um, so we just tried to, with the event, try to bring, you know, all the best uh, financial content forward and showcase that at the event. It's really a marketing and business conference for financial geeks. That's kind of how I like to spin it. And uh, we have it once, once, once a year. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that term financial geeks. You know, it's it's about time that geeks are cool, right? It's like back in the day it was the uh the athlete and then slowly and slowly as the internet started becoming a larger part of people's lives, geeks started becoming like a cool word. Yeah, it's really interesting. What was it like back in 2004 and 5 and 6 whenever you started um doing financial blogging online? I mean, I know that I didn't have a blog until maybe 2007 for the very first time, 2008 maybe. But what was it like back then, the environment? Yeah, back then it was very anonymous based. So that's why I started going by PT initially, because I didn't really want to, sh the, the idea of sharing your personal finance information, sharing how your money worked online with other people, your goals, your, you know, all your financial plans, everything, your net worth was really scary. And uh, the internet was still sort of this, what's, well, you know, kind of unknown space. It wasn't real world. It was really online world. And slowly right. over the years, those two have come together. And so people are, are, have become more comfortable being themselves and you sort of almost have to be yourself in the, in the internet these days. Um, but back then it was very anonymous. And so it really bred this idea of opening up the books and really showing, showcasing like your net worth and what all was sort of happening with your money. And it was the first time for many of us that we had seen like someone else besides our own self or maybe our parents, like how we were handling our oh, finances. Oh yeah, the insides. Yeah, how we were handling our finances, our goals. And so it was very inspiring for me. It was like, whoa, these people are doing like awesome things mm. with their money and what's preventing me from doing like that? I mean, you sort of look at your right. neighbor and you make assumptions based on the car they're driving, the house they have, the, the clothes they wear. You make assumptions about their finances, but you really don't know. But and in this, these blogs, I was able to actually see what people were actually doing. And it was, uh, it was really uh, eye opening for me. And so it was totally inspirational. Yeah, do you remember some of the people that you were keeping up with back in the day before you started your own blog? Oh, absolutely. The biggest one for me was uh, consumerism commentary. Back then he went by flexo, uh, but now <laughs> flexo. Yeah. And now he's, uh, his name is, you know, is Luke Landis, Harlan Landis, which, uh, he's, he's, uh, out in, in, you know, he's, he's the founder of the Plutus Awards, which is the awards that we have at the uh, conference. But right. uh, uh, other ones, Jim Wang from what used to be Blueprint for Financial Prosperity, I believe, what became mm -hmm. Bargaineering.com. Uh, and then, of course, J.D. Roth from Get Rich Slowly. Um, yeah, and how... Yeah, how it, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, Ramit Sethi from I Will Teach You To Be Rich. All these guys were like my heroes, like really uh, teaching me and... Uh, sort of working at some point, working alongside me to help me actually start my own blog and, and do my own thing. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how you can have mentors online that you listen to and learn from yet. They, they may not even know they're your mentor. Like one of my mentors is definitely Kate Erickson from entrepreneur on fire. I I've listened to so many of her podcasts and we speak a very similar, like logical systematic language. So I can very easily understand what she's trying to communicate and just learning from the openness of entrepreneur on fire, their balance reports, all the courses and stuff that they create. It's really amazing how the internet has become this bastion of value creation. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, like you said, you used to have to, I mean, you used to use a pseudonym PT because you didn't want that openness. You didn't want that vulnerability of people knowing who you are, but now you really add more value when you associate yourself to the content that you're creating online, because it's, it's like, it helps connect them with a real person. And even though they, they'll probably never meet you, just the idea that you're putting yourself out there, creating all this amazing value for a lot of it, most of it for free. And you're somebody real, so they can come up to you at your conference FinCon and it's, it, it, and just really appreciate that. And thank you. Like what's some of the feedback that you've gotten from longtime FinCon people and, and maybe even first year FinConers? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, we've had all kinds of, we've been doing it for seven years now, you know, so we had relationships formed out of it. Uh, we had a couple get married after meeting at FinCon. <laughs> so uh, it's really a great, a great community of people and they get together and just see the power of collaboration, working together and sort of field, forming relationships and working together going forward. So what I really like to see is folks collaborating and come up, coming up to me saying, Hey, I, we formed this mastermind group, mm -hmm. you know, out of being at FinCon and each of us have, you know, 10 X our business in the last year. So things like that. So, um, there's also people who come to the event, you know, really have become as newbies have come and learned a couple of years. And then by the year two or three, they're like on the main stage, like, you know, telling right. us, showcasing exactly what they're doing to reach mm -hmm. consumers, you know, with their money story and uh, really impressive stuff. So it's, uh, it's fascinating to see this community grow. Yeah. So showcase FinCon for us, you know, talk us through the transition from you just having a blog, how many years it took and like what finally made you start planning and creating and thinking about a conference. Yeah. So I started going to, by the time I came, became a full-time blogger, I'd started going to some other events like blog world expo, affiliate marketing summit. And when I was there, I found myself finding the other financial bloggers that were at the event and really skipping the sessions and skipping everything and just wanting to spend all the time with them, like workshopping and sharing best practices and talking about how we could collaborate or do, do things better together. And so after a couple of events like that, I said, well, Hey, this event thing's pretty cool. I like going to this, but I find myself just wanting to hang out with these specific people. And I feel mm -hmm. like they're the same way along the same time. At the same time, I created this, uh, online map using a Google maps tool, essentially that pinpointed all the financial bloggers across the U S and across the world where they were so that they could meet up and connect with each other. So I was always, always sort of in the idea with the idea of trying to connect the creators together. And so I took that, that passion for connecting, uh, people who were doing what I was doing and then just decided to throw my hat into the ring. I, I'd never really planned an event before, so I didn't know, I was obviously scared to do it, and but I, I knew it was a great idea. And I knew, I knew right. I wanted to, here's the important part. There was an event I wanted to go to and it hadn't been made yet. And so I knew mm. I was making the event that I wanted to go to. You um, know, yeah, yeah I, I really feel that and relate to that. You know, I asked you to come talk to me. I, we didn't know we were going to record it first, but because I love to plan, I've got the idea in my head of a Liberty and entrepreneurship conference. I've been to a lot of Liberty conferences and entrepreneurship conferences, but the conference that I really want to go to doesn't exist yet. So how long did it take you from coming to that idea to actually start putting it in motion and getting the wheels turning? Yeah. So, um, I, I think it was mid January of 2011 had the idea. And I was talking to my wife that night, I remember, and she was just sort of, I'd, I'd mentioned it to her a few times before. And I think I was keeping her up late at night talking about it in bed. And she was just like, just go make the site already. Just start it already. And I literally got up without going to sleep and uh, spent a couple hours online built, buying up all the domains that I could that for the names that I could think of uh, financial blogger conference, financial summit, uh, money blogger, you know, conference, all this stuff and mm -hmm. built out the website settled on financial blogger conference. And, uh, and the next day I showed it to my friends, other bloggers in a forum uh, that I created. And everyone just was like, well, this is amazing. Let's do it. I'm there hands down. This is a great idea where, how can we help? So it mm -hmm. was really a, an outpouring, you know, immediately from the community of folks who wanted to participate and, and help out with it. So that immediately validated the idea. Um, I created an email list. Um, which I'll, I'll allow people to opt into because I didn't have a ticket to sell right away. I wanted to give people a chance to, I knew enough about lead capture to know that I needed to capture the interest as soon as I announced it. So I just put an email box out there and allow people to yep. sign up for that and a Facebook group. I created not a Facebook group. I created a Facebook page, business page, yeah, business page. And so I put a box on the homepage of the website that basically said, like, if you're attending or, or you want to go, I don't think Facebook right. events yet but uh, they had Facebook pages. And so I, I put that and I put it, put it where all the images would show up, you know, the, the, the heads of the, the, 
profiles oh, of the right. people. Oh, right, of everybody that did, right. Yeah, so it was like this social proof thing. So it was like before you knew it, there was like 15, 20, 30, 40 people with their faces, you know, liking this thing. And so- it, Showing showing your community. Yeah, it immediately started showing a little community there and um, social, right. social proof for the event. So in, so in any way, you know, for, for any budding event planners out there, capture the lead um, and then- uh, you know, so social proof as soon as you can. Cause I didn't have speakers. I didn't have a ticket price. I didn't have anything. I think I had picked, Just had an idea. Yeah. I picked Chicago. I think based on the fact that some of the forum members were sort of centered around the Chicago area. And I knew that if I went there, I could get at least some people to drive in. <laughs> That's kind of how I was thinking about this thing the first year. Sure. And, and how many people were you hoping to get your first year doing FinCon? Uh, a hundred people. Yep. Okay. That, yep. And in my mind, I had built a kind of a conference in my head for a hundred people. Um, mm -hmm. I sort of knew the space. Well, I definitely knew the space enough to know that there were probably a thousand personal finance bloggers out there at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I, if I figured I could get 10% of them, that would be pretty good. But, uh, as soon as I launched it, I, like I said, I really got that feedback of, well, this thing could be really be bigger if I wanted to really push it, you know? So I immediately switched plans to creating two conferences. Like, so I created a 100 person conference and a 250 person conference. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, if we reach that 100 person conference mark, then we'll sort of open it up to become a 250 person conference. So I kind of hedged my bets there where mm -hmm. I didn't bite off more than I could chew with, you know, the expenses I was putting into it, the time I was putting into it and all the uh, sponsorship stuff. Um, you know, I kind of sold, sold the hundred dollar or the hundred person event first with the caveat that, Hey, if this reaches a hundred people, we're going to expand it to two fifty, and then there'll be more opportunities, uh, that open up. So, and, and how many people on average come every year right now? Uh, we've grown every year and, uh, we, that first year we ended up with 250 folks and in Dallas we'll have 1500 folks. Wow. Congratulations. So, yeah. that, that's amazing growth. That's in what, six years. Yep. That's, that's wonderful. So let's talk about the sponsorships. This is something that I've been thinking about, you know, for, uh, again, I'm not trying to make this show about me PT, but I can just relate so much because I'm in the process of hopefully thinking about a conference. Whenever you were approaching sponsors, can you give us an idea of like how much you were asking for back then or how many sponsors you were looking for or just any like things that really cool tricks that you learned? Yeah. So at first I said, okay, this conference is going to cost so much. I went to the hotel, found out what the menus were, how much the catering was going to be, um, how much to rent the space. By the way, if you sell a bunch of hotel rooms and guarantee a certain amount of food and beverage, you don't have to rent the space. You get it for free uh, with, ho awesome. with hotels. And on, the, on a side note there, I would also recommend working with a consulting company uh, to help find the hotel for you. Uh, I use a company called Helms Briscoe. And okay. they do all the contract negotiation and find the hotels free of charge. The hotels pay them a little commission. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, the first thing I did was list out all my expenses. And then I said, how about we just get a sponsor to cover each of these expenses? You know, and I don't even think I charged more than what the expense was. And in some cases, I just guessed what the expense might be and put a number on the paper and, and put a simple Word document up and said, here's all the expenses of the conference. Here's what you can sponsor essentially. So I kind of mm. NASCAR it out, you know, said, yeah, that's great. Every, everything's up for grabs here. We're, we're going to get name tags. So if you want to sponsor the name tag, help, help me pay for it. Everybody uh, gets a sticker on the car. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and, uh, everything sort of had a need at first and I didn't have the concept of, uh, really like a, a key partnership or anything initially out of the gate. It was really just sort of caught like expense based. I think that's a right. good place to start. But then I started looking at other the conferences and how they did things. And I saw that, Hey, there's more equity to kind of spread around here versus just like covering the costs. Like you could, you know, make someone, you know, a sponsor that you mentioned from the main stage or let them put a banner up, or you could put their logo on the website, or there's all these sort of different things you can do to kind of, cause you've got equity now as an event planner, as an event owner, um, that you can kind of spread out to different partners. And so, um, when I talk, when I early, when I talked about the hundred person conference and the 250 person conference, one of the things I did to build in, uh, different sponsorships was I said to myself, if we go to that 250 person model, I'm going to open up exhibiting space. Mm -hmm. So I, I withheld the exhibitor spots, uh, for that first model conference. And then I finally released them, uh, once we reached a certain point. And so 
man, there's a big ROI from uh, selling exhibit space because there's really not much expense associated with it. Mm -hmm. And for the uh, exhibitor, there's a big perception of value because they're getting all these you know, conference attendees coming by their booths, talking to them and really doing like transactional business at the conference right, versus right. just being associated with purchasing something or branding something. Or, or just the website where you're trying to get leads by your email address. This is a, especially for salespeople, this is a good interaction, good practice for them to build mm -hmm. the personal skills needed, for, in my opinion, to run a successful business. Yeah. Just get out there and meet, meet your potential customer, or in this case, meet your media partners. So that's really what I was selling with comp with FinCon was I was going to a fidelity or an ally bank and saying, Hey, these attendees, yeah, they might be a customer or whatever, but more importantly, they could talk to you about their 10,000 followers and 10,000 listeners about what you're doing. And you know, those right. people could become your customers. So I had a very high leverage factor with my attendee. And I think a lot of conferences don't necessarily have that. It's more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but, uh, you know, to think about, think about that. If you've got that, you've got the ability to kind of leverage the attendees audience versus just the attendee. Yeah. And, and I know you mentioned that you had never planned anything like this before. How much of just your entrepreneurial perspective and mindset do you accredit for building such a successful conference? Um, well, I certainly have a certain level of like stick to itness, you know, um, because it, it took me four years to really make it profitable. So I don't know if I'm the smartest guy in the room, but I definitely stuck with it long enough to make it work. Um, so I attribute that, you know, the, the, basically the not giving up um, mm -hmm. approach and just if, that I, persistent work ethic. Yeah. I'm finally figuring, well, to be totally fair, I had a really successful business in PT money at the time. And so I, in a way, I almost felt like the conference was just icing on the cake. As long as I didn't lose money, um, it was providing so much indirect value for me as being a member of the community and now becoming the guy who's throwing the party, um, yeah, exactly. and inviting everyone and putting people on stage and working with partners. Uh, it was such a value for me. I would have done it. I would continue doing it for free if PT money, you know, around year four PT money sort of did my, my main website did, did sort of take a little bit of a hit. And so, uh, I needed the conference to be more profitable you know, to, to be worth the time that I was spending it in it. And so I did a couple of things there we can talk about to really try to crank up the numbers. Yeah, for sure. G go ahead, please. Yeah. So as I mentioned, the conference was growing. So there was a certain degree of scale that was happening. And I was seeing as long as your margins stay the same, you know, you grow the number of people that come to the a conference, you typically can grow your income. But I did a couple other things to kind of ramp that up. I, we created a full on expo hall in the conference so we could now charge more for um, our exhibit space and offer more exhibit space like as i told you there's a big um, margin for uh for exhibit space and so the more of those you can offer and sell the more money you can make in an event so we turned it into a complete expo where we have you know lots of booths and interaction going on in and around the booths uh, throughout the event so that uh so there's a lot of value there for the sponsors you know, there was a lot of buzz whenever I was at FinCon. Everybody was networking and even in the exhibit hall, you know, I think the exhibit hall and the, where the speakers were speaking were two different places, but there was just some really good energy. So thanks for sharing that there's a good ROI on uh, the exhibit hall there because it's a lot of fun and it makes money. Yeah. And we sort of want to create like a hub around that. No one really wants a like dry, boring exhibit hall that they have in a standalone in a box somewhere that they have to go check and get swag and then leave or whatever. Um, so I didn't want to create that experience. I wanted it, uh, a lively carnival, like almost like fun, interactive experience where people would want to go and hang out and it would be interactive. So we add content to our expo hall. We add, uh, live podcasting as close as possible. Sometimes in the expo hall itself, we do a big lounge in there. We do some meals in there so that people can kind of just stay in there and experience that hub throughout the event. Um, another thing we did that probably add the biggest to the bottom line was create a premium level ticket. So my event, it really is an association of people. And so I always wanted you to feel like when you show up at the event that everyone is there and for me to sell that experience, everyone has to be there. So they have to afford it. Right. So I always have, there's like pressure to keep my tickets costs, like really let my ticket entry level really low. And at the same time, I don't really like the idea of creating like a 
two-tiered system where there's these VIPs at the event that the speak they're the speakers or VIPs and then there's like the peons everyone else I, I, I'm right. not I really want like a more of a flat hierarchy where you show up and the attendees or some of them are speakers and um, really just everyone is there from the community and everyone's talking hanging collaborating and so I ask a lot of my speakers to really participate in the event and thank you for doing that by the way last year you really dove mm -hmm. into the event and um, helped out with the mentoring and helped out with or were there for the opening party and things like that. So um, long story short, I just settled on what we call the pro pass. So I figured out that some attendees will pay extra to have guaranteed like meeting times with the brands that come and sponsor the event. And so we created basically a place for them to meet and time slots for them to book. We have an online system that can opt into that and meet with each other for a couple of hours over the event. And so only people who are, want to pay for that uh, extra experience who are making money through this event, uh, you know, we'll charge a little extra for that. So we charge 200 or 150, 200 or more for that ticket. It's called the Pro Pass. And then we also do throw those folks, uh, we also give those folks opportunity to go to the speaker mixer as well. So there is a little bit of a VIP-ish angle to it. Uh, yeah, we, I wish I, I could avoid, but um, I don't know. That's, that's you part know, of the package. People love the, the smaller groups. Like I, I went to a conference called the Rhodium weekend conference, shout out to Chris Yates and the Rhodium people. Um, and it was a, it was a small conference, much smaller than, than FinCon. But even within that, they sold a, a dinner package where you could have, you know, more access to some of the speakers. And it was my first year there. So I, I bought that pass and it allowed me to like create some friendships and like really get to know people one-on-one -on -one rather than trying to bump into them, you know, at, at the main conference or something. So I, I, I understand your hesitation pt i think from a, a business standpoint it's a really great idea and a, a good, another yeah. really high value product and source of income for you can you give me an idea i know that you're currently planning fincon once a year and, and you can add on to that if you'd like but how much time each week do you currently spend to plan fincon let's call it the off season or whatever yeah i'm spending probably 10 to 15 hours a week planning it, strategizing on it. And I have two full-time employees now on it. So that has helped a lot. So that first year I spent a lot of time, but, uh, you know, I've had, uh, VAs and people who've done part-time work for me. And now I have two full-time employees. One started in January, one started in, uh, March. So it's freed up a lot of my time. Yeah. Where are your virtual assistants based? Well, uh, I have a developer in the Philippines. And then I have uh, someone here local in da the Dallas area. Shout out, I mean, to Liberty VAs, uh, my own company that I formed just a couple months ago. If you're looking for a virtual assistant, specifically from the Philippines, I can definitely help you out. So you're spending about 10 or 15 hours each week. Now walk us up to like a month before the conference. What is it looking like for you then? Yeah, it's definitely go time. So we're planning every last detail, working on programming, finalizing the schedule, uh, holding hands with the exhibitors and sponsors every day, taking calls all the time. We are really focused on like finishing the details with the hotel because now we sort of have a really good view of what our final numbers are going to be. So we're picking out, you know, final menus, final uh, sort of like room placements, chairs, things like that, um, where things will be staged. Um, and just those little, all those little fine tuned loose ends that you think of, like, how do we attract more people to the booths in the expo hall? How do we make sure there's a proper transition between, you know, pe between keynote speakers, like, um, all the sort of script writing for our MC, um, just all those little details that kind of start piling up on you toward the end. It's, it's 12 hour days that we're with, you know, for the last three, three to six weeks there from your experience, how important is attention to detail and making the attendee really feel taken care of? Yeah. So that's increasingly becoming important as our communities grows and as it becomes more than just the people sort of, I know, you know, so, um, I want to make sure that people, new people coming into the community feel welcome. Um, and people coming back feel rewarded, you know, for doing that. So we try to, uh, you know, greet, greet folks as they come in, uh, make the check-in process as quick and seamless as possible. Uh, make it fun, make it seems like they've arrived at the party. Um, and then throughout the event, make it easy to transition from phase to phase. I mean, for the most part, people know how to handle themselves at a conference. 
but um, you know, if, if depending on the space you're at, what I try to always do is go to the ho we go to the hotels beforehand and we walk the event as if we were attendee ourselves. And so we try to think about you know we try to I, I try to ask my team you know to give me like ten like what could go wrong things like that that could happen at the event. They all have to pitch me ten. Let's screw up the how do we screw up the conference in ten ways? And they all pitch right. those to me, and then we all create um, you know plans to address each of those kind of ideas. So we kind of what's that called contingency planning? We do some of that. But in terms of just making sure the attendees feels welcome, I mean, we um, we try to encourage the you know community as much as possible to help us out with that. We get volunteers for the conference, um, so it really feels like it's really a. a a crowdsourced event or a, an event that you like own in a way. So uh, like you're a part of, yeah, like, you, know, yeah. you, re you really feel like you're a part of this community. It was one thing I actually met you and a lot of the FinCon people at the podcast movement conference, mm -hmm. which shout out to Jared and, you know, awesome conference. I think you do an amazing job. Um, but he did the same thing. You know, you just feel like you're a part of this community. And whenever I start hanging out with the FinCon people, within the podcast movement conference, it was like, I could feel that, that sense of community and that strength of community and that buzz, I guess that's just the word that keeps coming to me. It was like a buzz in this group. And they were always introducing me to other FinCon people. It was, it was really amazing. I was really impressed with the environment and the energy that is associated with your conference, uh, PT. It's, it's really amazing. What do you accredit that to just most high level? At the highest level, we are the people online who are sharing our net worth. We're talking about our finances. We're doing what most people don't do. And we're doing it because we know it helps people with their money. At the end of the day, we're looking out for consumers and their pocketbooks and their future financial life. Um, and so we see ourselves as a band of people doing this together to, to create better financial literacy in this country and in this world. Um, and so with that posture, we were less competitive and we're more collaborative. And, uh, you know, we see ourselves just, you know, fighting a fight together. And I think that just creates that natural, uh, camaraderie. Yeah. It's a free, it's a real free market solution to try to achieve something, achieve a goal or to move towards something and aligning yourself with your tribe, people that are similar in their focus and what they're working for. It's, you know, this is how problems get solved in society. This is how we progress society by these free market ways to collect ourselves together, figure out who each other are. How can we work together? Like you said, you love it when people come up to you and tell you how much better their business is doing because of the connections that may, they made of FinCon. Mm -hmm. I, that is, that is absolutely wonderful PT. I would like to get into the freedom segment here, sure. unless you have something else that you'd, you'd like to add about FinCon in general. No, let's do it. Let's do freedom. How has being an entrepreneur and building this conference created more freedom in your own personal life? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a young guy with a, with a family. So I guess not so young anymore. I'm 41, but have kids that are young, eight, six, and three. And so, you know, I can drop my kids off at school every day. I can pick them up. Um, I can call my own shots. I just went for a long two hour lunch with my wife and my son. We stopped by pet land on the way home and looked for some puppies to pet. <laughs> I wasn't rushing back to do anything other than, you know, be here on this podcast with you. So, um, I'm lucky in that I can, uh, you know, make my own decisions. So, and, and really have autonomy in, in the businesses I want to create and the way I want to iterate on them. It's fantastic. So it's created a lot of lifestyle choice and freedom, almost in a way, the first couple of years was almost overwhelming. Uh, I didn't know what to almost do with my time and energy, um, having it all on my own shoulders to make those choices. And so it's a different challenge, but, uh, yeah, I feel totally free as an entrepreneur at this point. Yeah, it's really awesome. Um, you know, I want to give a shout out to a couple of people that I met at FinCon and at the podcast movement, Jessica, Eric, Shannon, Melanie, of course, my man, Jared Easley and Miranda, all of you are really awesome doing, creating really amazing content, valuable content on the internet. PT, if people would like to keep up with you or keep up with FinCon, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, hit me up, PT at FinConExpo.com. You can always just check out the website, FinConExpo.com. It really explains what happens at our event or events now. We're rolling out other events and uh, it's a way for you to connect with our community as well. 
I'll make sure and post all of your social media links in the show notes. PT, I really appreciate you coming on the show. You're for sure a Liberty entrepreneur. I can't wait to see you again, my friend. Thanks, Ash. I appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in to the Liberty Entrepreneurs podcast, episode 67, the early days of the FinCon Financial Conference with PT Money. I may have gotten the most value out of that interview than anyone in this community, but you know that's kind of why I started this podcast initially. So I had a really great platform to reach out to people who are building a freer future and influencers who have gone through some of the steps that I'm trying to go through now, learn from their mistakes and build faster and stronger. If you like this interview, then please share it with your friends. It means a lot to me and helps the cause that I'm trying to promote that entrepreneurship, specifically digital entrepreneurship, is the best way in my experience to live the freest life possible. And if you help spread this perspective, then I'd really appreciate that. Until next week, you know what to do. Keep building freedom.